release all the turbulence of Monday office work and nourish the divinity of our own soul with some spiritual knowledge. We are all are you read? Yes, you know I'm yesterday Anita had requested that I talk a little about Vithal Dev. She's not here. Why don't you record it for her? Oh, so I'll incorporate certain stories of Lord Vithal. We are all travelers on a spiritual journey. Some people are not aware, but the world, the universe is still pushing them along. You people are aware, and that is why you come to facilitate your progress to such a program. On any journey you undertake, you wish to see some milestones. In India, when the British ruled, they established milestones on the roads. When you were traveling, you saw the milestones. It reassured you your path is right. The destination is coming closer. And hence you became enthused to progress. On the spiritual path as well, there must be some milestones to inform us how far have we progressed and how much still remains. They actually are. There are various pathways to God. Ashtang Yoga, as everybody is nowadays familiar, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. It's got the eight limbs, Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyahar, Dharan, Dhyan, and Samadhi. To the ultimate enlightenment, there are these eight steps. <coughs> On the path of Gyan Yoga, the eight steps are Vivek, Vairagya, Shamadhi, Shat, Sampatti, Mumukshutva, Shravan, Manan, Nididhyasana, and Samadhi. Spiritual trance. Now, yoga is good for the health. But as a path of spiritual practice, its efficacy in Kali Yuga is very limited. And Jnana Yoga is next to impossible, Nirvinanam Jnana Yoga. The simple, straightforward path to the ultimate enlightenment is Bhakti, Bhakti Yoga, love for God. That is why you all are here to practice this sadhana of devotion. On this path, what are the milestones? In the Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu written by Rupa Goswami, one of the respected books on this path, there are eight steps to the final frame, to the final goal of divine love for God. There are these eight steps. The first is Shraddha, then Sadhu Sang, then Bhajana Kriya, then Anartha Nivritti, then Nishtha Ruchi, Asakti Bhav, and Pray. Now these are then the milestones that let us know how much we have traversed and how much of the journey yet remains. It's good to familiarize yourself with these steps. 
So he says the whole journey begins with the first step, which is Shraddha or faith. Why is faith necessary? Because as of now, you cannot see your soul and you cannot see God. You need a leap of faith. A scientist also makes a leap of faith, but mistakes thinking I don't have a leap of faith. The scientist assumes there is no God. That's also an assumption. Can you prove there is no God? You can only prove there is no God if you know everything in the universe. Because if you don't know one thing, that one thing may be God. So one person has assumed there is no God. One person has assumed there is God. Faith is required everywhere. You begin the journey by having this faith. There is something beyond life as well. Death is not the end. I'm not a bunch of chemicals that upon death I become mud and the story is over. I am something beyond this body and I will continue to exist after death. That is the definition of Aastic, one who has faith. So that little bit of leap of faith, I am the soul, there is some supreme power, starts us off on the journey. Now once you start off, what do you do? The second step then comes, Satasang. Sadhu Sang, you associate with the holy personalities. This is called Sat Sang. There are two kinds of Sang, Ku Sang and Sat Sang. Because there are two realms, the realm of Maya and the realm of God. That association which makes your mind worldly is Kusang. Listening to unnecessary TV channels, reading unnecessary magazines, whiling time away wastefully with friends, this all takes your mind to the world. It is Kusang. And Satsang is that which takes your mind to the truth. That makes you wise. That illumines your intellect uplifts your mind. The Satasang is highly praised in the Vedic scriptures. Parikshit had asked Shukadev, how will I get rid of the abhadra things, the inauspicious things in the heart? Anger, greed, resentment, hatred, desire. How to get rid? The Shukadev answered in the Bhagavatam. Nashta prayeshva bhadreshu. Srinvatam swakatham krishnaha punya shravana kirtana riddyam tasthoya bhadrani vidhunoti surit satam. He said, Parikshit. You hear Krishna Katha, descriptions of the glories of the Nam, Rup, Leela, names, forms, virtues, associates, pastimes of the Supreme Lord from the mouth of a saint. That hearing will automatically start removing all inauspiciousness from inside. So that is Satasam. No, this is the second step. It is said only the fortunate come to satsang. Bhagyo dayena bahujanma samarjitena satsangamam chalavate purusho yadavai. When your accumulated pious merits of many lifetimes 
come to that point, then God creates your faith in satsang. He inspires you from within. Go, you will get something. And this is now the second step, satsang, which we are all doing. From satsang, we receive tattva jnan or knowledge. That knowledge, you see, first you only had faith. And when you did satsang, you got the knowledge of the scriptures. That knowledge put your faith on a firm footing. If you only have faith and not knowledge, it is shaky. Let us say you are doing bhakti of Lord Krishna and you listen to Swamiji's lecture and you said, okay, I'll also do bhakti. And you met a friend. He said, what are you doing nowadays? You know, nowadays I do Radhe Govind, Radhe Sham. Why? One Mukundanam came and said, you do Krishna Bhakti. Your friend says, what nonsense you got into? <laughs> Don't you know Krishna was a loafer? <laughs> he used to run after the gopis. After those coward damsels in the village. <coughs> now your friend is totally zero in spiritual knowledge. But if you are also zero and you hear him, you will say, really, Krishna was not God. Then what is this Krishna Krishna I'm doing? <laughs> your bhakti will be destroyed from the root. And that is why, now you don't have all saints in the world, you meet all kinds of people. So it is said, in order to progress solidly and securely, you need to strengthen your faith by proper understanding. So through the satsang, you get to know who you are. I am the eternal soul. Who is God? There is one God. He is all-powerful and infinite. He can take on as many forms as he likes. Once I was giving a lecture in Greenville and I was explaining there is one God. One Westerner had come to listen to the lecture. After the lecture, he accosted me, Swamiji, you say there is one God and look how many deities are there in this temple. I said, look, they are all different forms of the one God. God is infinite in capacity. We are limited to one form because we are finite. You cannot at the same time stay in your office and also go for a walk and also come for the satsang. You can be in one place at one time, but God is infinite. In one form, he becomes the king. In one form, he becomes the divine lover. In one form, he's the creator. In one form, he's the maintainer. These are all different forms of the same one God. In Pandharpur, a village in Maharashtra, there is a deity of Lord Krishna called Vithalev. And his associate, his uh, Ardhangini Rukmani. So they are Rukmani Vithaldev. Now one businessman in that village desired to give a kamar patta, a waste band for the deity made of gold. Now the best goldsmith in the village was a person called Narhari. He approached him and said that, please make the best kamar patta you can for Vithaldev. Narhari was a staunch devotee of Lord Shiv. So Narhari was so staunch in his views, he would refuse to see any form of Vishnu or Krishna. So he said, the trader said, come and take the measurements of the deity and make it. He said, no, Baba, I am not going there. 
If you want, without my seeing, place the order. So the trader went, got the measurement of the waist and said, make it like this. So Nana Hari made the kamar patta and gave it. When the businessman took it, he found that it is too big. So he brought it back. He said, it is too big. Please shorten it. So Nara Hari shortened it, said, now take it. This time he took it and found it is too short. He came back, he said, look, it's not working out. Why don't you come and measure it yourself? Said, if I measure it, I will have to see Krishna. And my principle is I will not see anybody except for Shiv. So the trader said, let's do one thing. Let's blindfold you and you go and measure it. So he said, all right. He agreed. So Narahari was blindfolded and brought to the temple. And now when he started measuring, he thought that he's feeling Lord Shiv. His deer skin and his mundmahal, his garland around him. He opened his eyes and he saw this Krishna there. Oh my God. <laughs> again he measured again. He thought it is Shiv. Again he opened his eyes. He saw it is Krishna. And that time he realized that Lord Shiv and Krishna are one and they are giving him a divine realization. So since that episode took place, on the back of the altar, a shivling has been installed in that temple just to convey the message to all the devotees of Krishna and to Shiv that they are different forms of the one supreme almighty God. So from the satsang, we get Mahatmya Gyan, knowledge of God. Plus number two, we get Sambandh Gyan, knowledge of our relationship with God. Plus number three, Seva Gyan, that my eternal position as the soul is servant of God. And hence, my final goal in life is how to serve God. So through satsang, you get these three kinds of knowledge. And then your faith becomes, alongside with the faith, you have got the knowledge. Just like in the war, people have the shield and the sword. Now you progress further. There are not everybody from satsang goes to step three. Because there are two kinds of people who do satsang. One are the jigyasu and the other are the pipasu. Jigyasu are those who desire to know. The thirst for knowledge has brought them to satsang. But Pipasu are those who don't only desire to know, they also want to experience God. By virtue of their past sanskars of past lives, the thirst for God has awoken in them. So one who is thirsty, one who is hungry, is not contented merely by knowing. If the husband returns hungry from the office and tells the wife, look, I am so hungry. Please give me something to eat. And the wife says, you know, the JKO cookbook has just been published. Come, let me show you. This is how the chutney is made. <laughs> the husband says, it's made very well. Will I get something to eat? <laughs> look, look, look. This is how the sweet dish is made. Husband says, so nice. Now let me tell you, this is how the soup is made. 
The husband says, look, these recipes are not going to fill my stomach. I need to put something in. So in the same way, through the satsang, you get to know what is to be done. After that, you have to do it. And if you keep listening what is to be done and don't do it, then you are not going to progress. Once in the year, 20 years ago in 1998, I was giving a lecture in Kolkata. So at that time, it had become like a satsang nagri. Because all the Marwadi businessmen used to keep getting satsangs arranged. All over the town, satsang used to take place. So I, my satsang was for 15 days. I was doing morning 7 to 9 and evening 7 to 9. One person came to me, he said, Swamiji, I'm so happy in Kolkata. You see, in the evening, I go to another satsang from 5 to 7. Then I come to yours from 7 to 9. <laughs> and in the morning, I go for another satsang 5 to 7. Then I come for yours 7 to 9. And when yours is over, the next Baba is going to come. I'm going to hear him. And after that is over, I'll hear the next one. 365 days a year, I get to hear satsang. So I said, then you must have attained many god realizations. But in satsang, you are only being told what to do. Now you have to do it. So the Jigyasu is happy with knowing that. And the Pipasu says, what next? See, when we had the lecture in the Pasadena Hindu temple, we used to have 120 people coming. They were all Jigyasus. But not all of them made it out here. So those who took another step were the Pipasus, who were thirsty. And that third step then, is the bhajana kriya. Bhajana kriya means the practical process of devotion. Through satsang you came to know what is to be done. The guru informed you. Now you started doing it. So what is to be done? There are various kinds of devotion. Shravan, Kirtan, Smaran, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakhyam, Atmanivedanam. These are the ninefold processes of devotion. You can do any process. You chant the name of God, you sing the Kirtans, you worship the deities, you serve in the temple. Offer prayers, create friendship towards God. You can do any. But the important thing is that you must have love for God. That love is the only thing that connects the soul with God. Everything else, God doesn't care for. That is why Saint Kabir said, Othi padhi padhi jagmuva pandit hua na koya dhai akshar prem ke padhe so pandit hoy. Reading the scriptures, the whole age went by. Nobody became a pandit. The one who learned love for God, these two and a half syllables of Prem, that is the true Pandit. So truly the essence of all the scriptures of the world is how to love God. One, Sufi Fakir, he told his friend, I have read the Bible, I have read the Quran, and I have read the Vedas. His friend said, you are illiterate, and you have read the Bible in Latin, and the Quran in Arabic, and the Vedas in Sanskrit. 
He said, I am saying so because all these great texts are teaching the same one thing, how to develop love for God. So the essence of all your spiritual practice is to try and enhance that love. In this Pandharpur that we just talked about, this village in Maharashtra, where the temple of Rukmini Vithal Dev is there. You see in India, there are over a hundred cities all over, which are famous for some one particular temple, which becomes the focal point of the whole city. It's like that's the center of the whole city. So in Pandharpur, there have been many saints who have lived there. And one such saint was Chokhamaya. Chokhamaya was a great devotee of Rukmani Vittal. And he could often be seen dancing outside the temple entrance. Rukmani Vithova, Rukmani Vithova. Dancing and singing. But he would never be seen inside the temple. Because the priests of the temple would never allow him entry. Unfortunately, he was born in a lower caste. So these priests, they had this concept that he's from a lower caste and he's not allowed entry into the temple. Everybody loved his chanting. But the hegemony of the priestly class was so strong that they could not quarrel with them. No matter how much somebody would explain that the sunlight falls equally everywhere, the sunlight doesn't discriminate. What kind of discrimination are you creating? They were, with the crippled intellect they had, they would create all these walls. So somebody taunted Chokhamaya that you are not even able to enter the temple. Lord Vithal, his blessings are not upon you. All this devotion you do is fruitless. Poor Chokhamaya was so disturbed. He was crying and crying that I am your devotee, my Lord. Will you not accept me? So one day, one night, he was crying in his house and his wife was consoling him. It is all right. When Vithal Dev appeared in his personal form and he gave him darshan right there, the Chukhamiya fell at the feet of his Lord and cried. Vithal Dev said, come, let me take you to the temple. He took Chokhamiya by the hand and brought him to this temple. Chokhamiya said, I am not allowed to enter. Vithal Dev said, these are the stupid rules created by ignorant people. For me, everybody is equal. So he said, come, let us enter the altar. Chokhamiya said, oh, it will all get desecrated. Vithal Dev said, how can it ever get desecrated? The child keeps the, the mother keeps the child in the lap. Even if the child urinates, the mother doesn't get desecrated by it. So he brought Chokhamiya right into the sanctum sanctorum. And there Chokhamiya said, my Lord, please tell me how to do bhakti or devotion. So Vithal Dev instructed him, always chant the names of God, avoid unholy association, have deep faith. He was giving him the lectures and it became morning time when the Lord used to be woken up by the priests. When the priests entered, they found Chokhameya there. They were horrified. 
So they pulled him out. How dare you? You have desecrated our place. We will have to sanctify it again. No matter how much he tried to explain to them, they were not interested. So they said, you have broken on the rule of our temple. Now what you have to do, you stay outside the city. So they constructed a wall and they said, you have to live on that side. Whereas some of the others, other such unfortunate people in those days, this kind of casteism was being practiced. So they also used to stay there. So Chokhameya was staying there, continuing with his life. But Vithaldev used to come at, to his house every day to give darshan. Now one Vithaldev came there and he asked his wife to make a meal for him. The wife brought the meal and she dropped it on him by mistake, carelessness. A priest was passing by at that time. So Chokhamiya scolded his wife. Why have you dropped the dal on Vithaldev? The priest heard. He thought he is accusing me that in the temple I dropped the dal on Vithaldev. <laughs> So the priest, he walked into the hut and slapped him. How dare you accuse me like that? And he went back. So when he reached the altar, he opened it. He saw that Vithal Dev's cheek was red. Immediately he put two and two together. That this is the consequence of the slap that I put on his devotee. It has reached his Lord's cheek. So he gathered all the priests and he said, Look, this is what happened. That Chokhamiya is a great devotee. So after that, they got him. They begged before him, Please come to the temple. It will be our privilege. And then Chokhamiya started entering and doing his kirtans. Life was again on even keel for Chokhamiya until one day he was a laborer by profession. He was working on creating a wall when the wall fell over and he got squashed to his death under the wall. So Vithal Dev, he came in the dream of the chief. Uh, there was another great devotee at that time called Namdev. A contemporary of Chokhamaya, two great saints at the same time. Kripaluji Maharaj has mentioned the name of Namdev. So, he came in the dream of Namdev and said that I would like my devotee to be buried in the ground just in front of the temple. Now, how do you find out which is his devotee? He said, you go there and check that body, the bones of which from there the sounds are coming, Vithal, Vithal, Vithal. That is the body of Chokhamaya. And Namde went there and discovered, yes, actually this is that body from where Vithal, Vithal sound is coming. So that was brought and buried right before the temple entrance. Even today you will find the Samadhi of Chokhamya there. He is revered as one of the great saints of Maharashtra. So, the, the, this important thing in the bhajan is love for God. That is the message from all the Puranas, all the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita. But to develop love for God, your spiritual practice must fulfill a few conditions. What are these conditions? Number one. I'm telling you from Kripaluji Maharaj. Number one. You must do selfless devotion. Nishkam Bhakti. What does that mean? In your Bhakti, 
डोंट आस्क गॉड फॉर मेटीरियल थिंग्स सुख संपत्ति घर आवे कष्ट मिटे तन का नन ऑफ दिस सेल्फलेस वी लव्ड द होल वर्ल्ड फॉर आवर सेक नाउ लव गॉड फॉर हिज सेक दिस इज सेल्फलेस so the first condition in your devotion make your devotion selfless second condition the devotion should be continuous continuous means not that you get up in the morning half an hour of devotion and then forget about god you see when your mind is engaged in god it is getting cleansed when it is in the world it is getting worldly or dirty now you clean your mind for 1 hour every day and dirty it for 23 hours it's like taking one step forward and five steps backward if you want to make substantial progress to reach the goal then you have to keep moving forward which means that you have to cut out minimize or eliminate the losses no minus how do you do that always mind in god so how do you keep your mind always in god practice to feel his presence with you he is there with me i am not alone he is there with me he is also in the temple but he is also right here so to practice that awareness this is the second condition nirantar continuous bhakti and the third is ananya bhakti ananya bhakti means your mind should only be attached to the divine god guru names of god forms of god nowhere in the material realm see what we do is that we attach the mind to god but then we also attach it all over in the world to rasgulla jalebi samosa <laughs> and in america you attach it to the dog as well <laughs> <laughs> somebody was telling me swami ji in the office everybody is talking about their dog <laughs> wherever the mind is attached that is what you will talk about so in this heart where you are supposed to bring only god ma make up you are bringing dog and so many other things it is no longer a heart it is a dharmshala a hotel you also come you also come you also come god says you cannot attain me like this the bible says you cannot love two masters for either you will hold the one and hate the other or love the other and hate the one no man can serve god and mammon Sri Krishna says, "Ananya cheta ha satatam yomam smarati nitya sha tasya ham sulava partha nitte yuktasya yogi na." Arjuna is easily attained. How? By those who are ananya. So, does ananya mean that we run away from the world? No. Ananya means you just learn how to live in the world. when you are not attached then all your works will be without any tension all your relationships will be without any anxiety because you will just be doing your duty so all this tension stress anxiety will all finish that is what lord krishna says yogina karma kurvanti sangam tyaktva atma shuddhe 
Arjuna yogi is one who can be doing all kinds of works, maybe a king or whatever, and yet no attachment. So, Ananya Bhakti. And then the next one is Rupa Dhyan. Meditate upon the image of God. This is the bhajana kriya that we engage in. Are you all engaging in that kind of bhajana kriya? Trying to at least, right? How many of you are doing the daily sadhana? We have created an online program. Who, are, who raised hands from behind? Anybody? Very good. Happy to know that. So we have created the program for you. You can just go online. Mara, if you, she has done it, she enjoyed so much, she can, can speak to her about how she benefited from that program. And this is the Bhajana Kriya. So to this level, most of, we, of people have come. And this is only step three. Then you go on to step four. Do you wish to know what is step four? <laughs> All right. Step four is anartha nivritti. Anartha nivritti means now the anarthas, the dirt in the heart, that starts getting cleansed. Anger, greed, tension, all this starts getting cleansed. It's a natural <coughs> consequence of your devotion. Devotion is like the medicine. If somebody is sick, the person takes the medicine and the cure must be effected. If the cure is not effected, then the medicine is wrong. You need to change the medicine. Similarly, the cure that we are interested in is the purification of the mind. Now the medicine for that is bhakti. You can keep on saying, do positive thinking, stop worrying and start moving. But all these self-help books are not going to help. No matter how much you keep reading, stop worrying and start living, the worries will not go. They will only increase. Why am I not stopping to worry and starting to live? But when you engage in bhakti, that devotion to the Lord cleanses the heart. Hence the Ramayana says, How will your heart be cleansed? Prema bhagati jala binu ragurai abhiyantara malakabahuna jai. Until you wash your heart in the pure water of love for God, the heart will not be cleansed. Now when you are doing bhakti, the cleaning is truly happening. How? How is that cleaning happening? Let's say your mind got 20% attached to God. That means it is 20% detached from the world. That means you have gained 20% spiritual power. Now if there is a 20% cause for anger, you will not feel angry. You got the power. You increased your attachment to God to 50%. There is one mind, you attach 50%. So it got 50% detached from the world. And when it is 50% detached from the world, that means your spiritual power has increased to 50%. Now if there is a 50% cause for anger, somebody is saying, Tum gade ho, murk ho. He is not getting angry. Your power has increased. And when the mind is 100% attached, means it is 100% detached. So, devotion is resulting in anartha nivritti, the cleansing of the heart. 
in this step number four, the important thing is to be sincere. Because sincerity enables us to see our own defects. If we are insincere, we will say, I am all right. And when we think I am all right, we will develop pride. And when we develop pride, we will start seeing the defects in others. And when we see the defects in others, we will stop seeing our own defects. But they are already there and because we don't see them, they will start increasing. And that is the reason why people get derailed from the spiritual path, insincere. But if you are sincere, you will say, where is the time to see anybody's defects? I have got such a bundle of defects inside, let me focus on this. So that is why one must always be humble. What is the test of humbleness? You know, the litmus test like you used to do in middle school. What is the test of humbleness? If you are humble, you don't see the faults of others. You don't have time to. You always focused on your own faults and how to improve them. And if your mind is running towards the faults of others, why is this person, why is that, why is that? So the litmus test says that your pride has increased. That is why your mind is running to others' defects. So in this cleansing stage, it is very important to be humble and to be sincere. Otherwise, so many go come to the path and so few succeed. But we have to succeed. So equipped with this, we will move ahead. How do you move ahead? We have got a few more steps. But I think it has already become a little tiring. Let's do a little kirtan and then complete. Guli Shri Radha Krishna Bhagwani Ki we were discussing the steps on the path of devotional progress. We discussed that it begins with faith or shraddha. The next step is sadhu sang, associating with the saintly personalities. The third from the saints, we learn how to do bhajan or devotion. So we engage in bhajana kriya. The fourth, as a consequence of bhajana kriya, our heart starts getting cleansed. Now the next steps. We will go quickly now. Step number five. What was step number four? Cleansing the heart. Huh? is taking. <laughs> <laughs> Step number five is Nishtha. Nishtha means firm faith. You see, faith started the journey. Again, faith is coming. This, all these keep growing as you come along. It's not that you shed the previous one when you go to the next category. As you progress, the faith becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. Until finally it will become so strong. I like to say that faith is the strongest thing in the world. The faith of the saints. You, the whole world tells them they are wrong. They will not shift their faith by one micron. One micron. How do they get such deep faith? We'll discuss. But it is so intense, the faith of the saints. Coming back to Rukmini Vithal. 
Another great devotee of Vithal Dev has been Sant Tukaram. His abhangas are sung all over Maharashtra till today. So at that time, there was a great Maharatha warrior. You know, in those days, India was overrun by Mohammedan rule. So it was very tyrannical rule where the majority were the Hindus and the Mohammedans were the emperors who would destroy the temples, torment the people. So one of the persons who rebelled was Chhatrapati Shivaji. He was famous as a great Maratha king, but he was also a great devotee. So his guru was Samartha Ramdas, and Samartha Ramdas guided him towards Saint Tukaram. So he started associating with Saint Tukaram and seeing him as his surrogate guru. Once, Tukaram was doing satsang somewhere and Shivaji, after all his material conquests, etc., had come to nourish his soul and was sitting in the satsang. When the news reached the Mohammedan army that Shivaji is in the satsang of Tukaram, then the Mohammedan commander he instructed his soldiers, go and find Shivaji and kill him. It will be easy. So, this Shivaji spies got to know. And they informed him, the Mohammedan army is near, you need to run away. Shivaji went to Tukaram and quietly said in his ear, I am in a dangerous position out here. I will need to leave. Tukaram said, sit down. Shivaji said, it's my Guru's Agya, I have to sit down. That is the faith. When I was studying the scriptures under Kripaluji Maharaj, first when he called me over, he said, okay, you study, then you have to teach that. So I asked him, what is the meaning of Shraddha? Faith. He said, faith means, if I tell you, he called me by my old name, if I tell you, get up, get out of the gate and never come back. You quietly do it. My guru has told me it must be for my benefit. That is faith. So he then he said, you know, that kind of faith no disciple has in the beginning. Even the guru knows. When the child has first started walking, the mother knows the child will fall a few times. The mother doesn't get discouraged. It's a part of the learning process. So Shivaji said, I need to run. The, the Muslim warriors are coming. Tukaram said, sit down. He sat down. Now he was in his civil dress. The warriors came, they looked around, they could not find. And they went and back and reported that we could not find him up there. The Mohammedan commander, he said, in that case, just kill all of them, whoever is there. You'll kill him as well. So now they went with the express intention of killing everybody who was in the satsang. And Shivaji is sitting there. And here is where faith and the grace of God comes in. So when he was sitting, the Mohammedan army was coming. And all of a sudden they found Shivaji running on his horse. I mean galloping on his horse. They said, there he goes. They all ran looking for him. And they thought that Shivaji is going. It was not Shivaji. Shivaji was continuing to sit there. Vithal Dev himself had taken the form of Shivaji and he took the, all the warriors until then they could not find where has he gone. So they went and reported to the commander that he ran out from there. We chased him but we could not find. The commander was astonished that I sent an army of 2000 and you could not handle that one Shivaji sitting in a satsang of 50 people. 
Vithal Dev came back and he whispered in the mouth, in the ear of Shivaji, it is all right. There is no problem. You can keep sitting. The army has gone. So Shivaji continued to sit out there. Now you hear hundreds of such stories arising out of the devotee's faith in God. Now in this step number five, the faith now has become strong. And why has it become strong? Because the heart has got somewhat cleansed. When the heart is somewhat, not fully, somewhat cleansed, you start getting the bliss of God. In other words, you start getting the experience. And when the experience comes, your faith becomes strengthened. First, it was just an intellectual. Swamiji has tell, told me, so let me believe it. And later on, by doing the sadhana, you got the experience. That is how science also works, right? You start with the hypothesis, you conduct the experiment, you get the results which prove or disprove the hypothesis. Somebody asked Sage Narad, the writer of the Bhakti Darshan, what is the proof of Bhakti? Narad ji wrote, Pramanantarasyan Pekshatvat Swayam Pramanatvat. This bhakti needs no proof. Your own experience will prove it to you. If somebody says, I am Swamiji, I am hungry. I say, prove that you are hungry. How should I prove that I am hungry? The circumference? Okay, my stomach has shrunk, that's why I am hungry. <laughs> okay, eat. Swamiji, I am full. Prove that you are full. How do you prove? The stomach has swollen, that's no proof, it may still be hungry. My own feeling is telling me I am hungry and my own feeling is saying I am full. Similarly, bhakti will not need an external proof. Your own experience will tell you, yeah, that thirst of my soul is getting quenched. For the first time, I went to Las Vegas and Atlantis City, etc. and Disneyland and Disney World, but nothing worked. And sitting in the Kirtan of Nikunj Rasa, I really get that bliss which I didn't get anywhere else. So that Bhakti is proving itself to you and strengthening your faith. This is Nishtha, step number five. But then the journey is not complete. You keep on still trying until you come to step number six. <coughs> this is Ruchi. Ruchi means now the bliss of God is getting particularly experienced. That you get such relish in bhakti that everything else seems insipid in comparison. That is the ruchi. God has got infinite bliss, but we are not able to relish it. Just like you give sugar cane to somebody who has got jaundice and say, how does it taste? This person says, bitter. Jaundice is bitter? <laughs> no, no, you know, my tongue is defective. That's the problem. So in the tongue defective, the sweet the sugar cane is appearing bitter. <coughs> what is the cure for jaundice? You keep on taking sugar cane and slowly it gets cured. Then you say, yeah, 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 it came in by experience. But in the same way, God seems bitter. You know, when I was giving a lecture a few, five, four years ago in the Northridge Temple, so we had announced that there's a life membership program if anybody is interested. <coughs> but one day when I reached there, when OG Minuji Drive drove me there, so when I reached, one husband and wife were standing with their <coughs> teenage daughter. And they said, Swamiji, we've decided to be life members. So we brought our daughter also. <coughs> he will give the shawl to us all. I said, okay, I'll give the shawl at the end of the program. 
that they had told their daughter, and look, Swamiji will be giving us a shawl, you also come. But they didn't realize that they will have to wait, sit through the whole program. <laughs> it was fine for them, but that 16-year-old daughter, it was like going into a torture chamber. <laughs> so, after the a program, I called them and offered them the shawl. They said, Swamiji, our daughter has made life hell for us. Why did you make me sit through all this? You see, the spiritual topic seems bitter. That is the sign of jaundice. <laughs> and the material topic seems so sweet. So what did the Republicans tell the Democrats and what did the Democrats reply to Trump and what is the latest scandal against Trump? <laughs> oh, you know, let me tell you something. Ah, what, what, what? You know that neighbor of yours? Ah, tell me. You know his teenage daughter? Ah, what about her? Why are you so interested? <laughs> she has started doing bhakti. Are what bhakti? I thought it would be something important. She is... <laughs> this worldly thing is, is giving us great relish. That is the sign of bhavagog, material affliction. Just like if somebody has been bitten by a snake, the person is sarp drushed. How do you check if the poison has spread? <coughs> you offer bitter neem and say, how does it taste? Is it bitter? He says, no, it is sweet. Then you know the poison has spread. So we've got this bhavarog, the worldly topics are seeming so relishable. But now you keep on doing your bhakti and the bhavarog is going. And that relish, the infinite bliss of God is coming into experience. So the sign of the relish is more of it, more of it. Swamiji, please don't stop at 9 o'clock. Can we go out at 11 o'clock? <laughs> That's the sign of relish. But the journey is still not complete. You progress further. And then the next step comes asana. Asakti means the mind is now almost fully attached to God. Quite attached. Fully attached means it will be God realized. Quite attached. So what happens when the mind is attached? The intellect is surrendered. The intellect no longer considers benefit or loss. Like somebody whose mind is attached to cigarettes. The Surgeon General warns that cigarette smoking is injurious to health. It is by rule written on all the cigarette packets. So the cigarette smoker reads it, but he doesn't care. It is injurious to health, doesn't matter. Poo, poo, poo. <laughs> that is why, remember I told you all, that a cigarette, what is the definition? It is a pipe. With smoke at one end and a fool at the other end. <laughs> How did the person become a fool? Attachment. So now the mind is attached to God. What is the consequence? Now you don't consider. Somebody says you do bhakti, you will go to hell. Say, you know, I may go to Maha hell, what to do now? <laughs> Somebody asked Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, why do you do bhakti? He said, it's my nature. When it's become a nature, then you don't care, right? Like now you say, somebody says, why do you grieve? First you're keeping it inside and outside and inside and outside. <laughs> and you just keep it inside or keep it outside? <laughs> he said, wait, this is my nature. If I don't do that, then I'll get suffocated. So similarly, bhakti now has become a nature. And this is asakti. So this is step number seven. And then comes step number eight, one before the final or penultimate. It is called bhav. Bhav means that 
God realization has not yet taken place. But it is just across the corner. Just like it's night time now. No matter what you do, you can't remove the night. Ask everybody in Pasadena to switch on their lights and let the sun, the moon be there in full and all the stars, no clouds. The night is refusing to move. One sun comes and the night is run away. It may be cloudy, you can't see the sun, but still the sun rays have taken away the night. That's the power of the sun. Like the sun is God, like the night is the material energy, Maya. But we are all under the darkness of Maya right now, right? We may get theoretical knowledge, but still the darkness is there. And even before sunrise, a few rays come and the night goes. People say, okay, the dawn has broken. Similarly, even before you get that preem divine love, a few rays of the yoga maya energy find their way into the heart. And then the heart is so cleansed. The sign of that cleansing is described Kshante Ravyartha Kalatvam Virakte Ramana Shunyata Asha Bandha Samutkantha Namagani Sadaruchi. Kshantar means complete peace. Such kind of peace that nobody can disturb. Kshanti means that somebody is insulting you and still and there's a reason for anger and still you are not angry. If there's no reason for anger, then anybody can be free. Like now is anybody angry? No. Nobody is angry. So is everybody beyond anger? <clears throat> not even one person is beyond anger. The only reason why we are not angry is the reason for anger is not the let it come. While eating prasad, if somebody throws dal at you, now the reason is huh? <laughs> So, where there is a reason for anger and still we are not angry, somebody is going on insulting us, that is the sign of the heart getting cleansed. Bhav Bhakti has come. But the journey is still not complete. You keep on pushing yourself more. You see, let's say you are crossing the Holy Ganga and you've crossed about 800 meters. There is only 50 meters left. So you can't say, what is it now? Let me jump into the river. Because you will still drown. <coughs> in the same way, we are still in Maya. You still carry on doing your sadhana. All the spiritual practice. And then finally it brings us to the point of Mami Kam Sharanam Raj. Where the mind is completely surrendered. And that point then the divine grace intervenes and you get that spiritual shakti or power called divine love. And when that comes... Now the God realization takes place. And forever the soul is united with God. So this is the divine journey. The nine steps to it. Bolie Vrindavan Bihari Laleki. Let's give a few minutes for some questions. Does anybody have any questions? <coughs> yes. Jinmay is going to ask. So, you know, in your stories, we have like examples of some devotees getting Bhagwan's version. Yes. And so what is the difference between that and then God realization? When you get the darshan, Good question. 
darshan is of different levels. It's like the search light. It goes, you see it going by. And then other it comes and stops there for two minutes. Right? Mm -hmm. So in the same way, before God realization, God sometimes, not there's no such rule, sometimes he gives a glimpse. So many devotees out here have had a glimpse. But they can't understand why it happened. God in his infinite wisdom did give a glimpse. In some form or the other. But that doesn't mean it was God realization. God realization means Tad Vishnu Paraman Padam Sada Pashyanti. Now you are always seeing God. You are liberated from the darkness of Maya. Anybody else? Yes, Salim. Um, I, I think you may have answered this I don't know, in the, in the, yesterday and today. Because I had this in my mind um, the last couple of months. The idea, for me, I was thinking as a self-discipline for the sadhana. And then I thought, because sometimes the mind is jumping here and jumping there. And then I'm saying, OK, well, if I have this self-discipline, what about the worry about being like a fanatic? In other words, not Discipline will not make you a fanatic. Discipline will liberate you from the mind and the senses. The more disciplined you become, the more you are a free person. To do what your intellect considers to be valuable. But that's, that's my, my question. So how can I trust my intellect sometimes? You sh can never trust your intellect unless the intellect is surrendered to God and Guru and illumined by the scriptures. The intellect otherwise is material. You have to illuminate with divine knowledge.